Most Americans are tired of the political system, which is why today's guest is running for Congress to help bring unity plus a brighter future for tomorrow. So let's talk about that. Instead of focusing on winning arguments, we're teaching the basic fundamentals of sales and marketing and how we can use them to win in the world of politics, teaching you how to meet people where they're at on the issues they care about. Welcome to The Brian Nichols Show. Well, hey there, folks. Brian Nichols here on The Brian Nichols Show, and thank you for joining us on, of course, another fun-filled episode. I am, as always, your humble host, joining you live from our Cardio Miracle Studios here in lovely eastern Indiana. Folks, the Cardio Miracle difference is real. I say that as someone who's been using Cardio Miracle now for over six months, and if you're looking for lower blood pressure, increased energy. Plus, if you're looking for maybe a little extra pump at the gym, we'll go ahead, join the tens of thousands of others who have enhanced their heart health, including yours truly using Cardio Miracle. And by the way, folks, if you use code TBNS at checkout, you get 15% off your order. You have nothing to lose because there's a 100% money back guarantee. So join the tens of thousands of others who have gone out and started their heart health journey. Cardiomiracle.com, code TBNS for 15% off your order. All right, let's talk politics, specifically in the world of electoral politics. Now, yes, if you are a longtime listener for The Brian Nichols Show, you know we like to more often than not talk about solutions to the problems we see outside of the political world. But let's just be real. The political world still exists. It's still functioning whether we want it to or not. So with that, we have to play the game. And playing that game, joining us today from Georgia, Michael Nixon running for Congress. Michael, welcome to The Brian Nichols Show. Hey, thank you, Brian. It is fantastic to be here. Great to have you on, and I'm really looking forward to uh, learning more about your your campaign, why you're running, the issues that you're going to be addressing that people care about in your district. But first, Michael, do us a favor. Introduce yourself here to the Brian Nichols Show audience, and why the heck are you running for Congress? Absolutely. Uh, Brian, as I said, my name is Michael Nixon. I am from Georgia, raised in Georgia, graduated uh, a little rural high school here in Georgia in Caldwell County. And right out of high school, I joined the military. And so I served active duty Air Force, active duty Navy. I deployed three times across those two separate branches, even got out in 2011. And then in 2019, I felt my service wasn't finalized serving this country. So I did go back into the Air National Guard in 2019, which I still serve in. However, on the civilian sector, uh, I have worked for a rural hospital for almost a decade now. I'm a director over a couple different departments, but it was very important for me getting out of the service and coming back to Georgia. I wanted to raise my family where I grew up. And now we're in this, in this area and in this time of the country to where things aren't like it was 20 years ago. Our economy is constantly in decline. Uh, Our, our military is not, got the reputation that it has had in, you know, five or even 10 years ago. My youngest son is a senior in high school and he wants to join the Air Force when he graduates. And 10 years ago, this would have, this would have just boomed me with pride and joy just because he's following in his dad's footsteps. He's wanting to get out there and serve his country. However, now it terrifies me. I look Mm -hmm. at the leadership and where our world is and where, you know, our country's headed and it's it, it really kind of makes me take a step back and say, you know, and why aren't I, you know, as eager and prideful for him to do this and follow my footsteps? And, and it's just because we have so many uncertainties and so many unknowns that we've kind of spiraled into over the last several years. And my oldest son has blessed my wife and I with a with a grandchild. And so we're, we're, we're grandparents, uh, this past Christmas, just last week, uh, we shared it with him. He was 18 months old, growing, bouncing, beautiful baby boy. And as a grandparent, you have that opportunity to kind of step back. You're, you're, you're not, you're not living life as a parent. You have that one step disconnection. So you have, you have the wisdom, the gray hairs actually mean something at this stage. And so you're, you're watching this young child grow, and then you you really more than ever start thinking about the future that they're growing into and the future that I want for my youngest son graduating high school and stepping into the world. The future that I want for my grandson just to grow up, just grow up, growing up into into this country. 
I want it to actually bear fruit and be productive and not constantly have to hit roadblock after roadblock that it seems that we're, we're currently facing in, in today's economy and, mm -hmm. and the struggles that, that we're facing as citizens. And so I've had long conversations with my wife, with my family, with my parents uh, that live three and a half miles down the road from me in this in this rural community that, that, that we're living in and said, listen, you know, the, the old adage is, is if you want to change something, vote. If voting doesn't work, march. And if marching doesn't work, it's time to run. And we're kind of at the stage now where we don't have enough vets representing us in in the government. Uh, we don't have a, a lot of business people representing us in the government. And we need more of those voices because politicians, these these lifelong politicians are not getting it done. They, they've got one agenda and sadly, the, the majority of their agendas is self-focused. And that is why they're there. They're, they're kind of turning their backs upon the people's voices, upon their districts and upon the states and upon this nation and, and forwarding their own agendas. And, and that's it. And so yep. we need people in there that that kind of speaks for the little person, speaks for the people that that have been there, that that have went and fought wars overseas, uh, been to third world countries. I've been what we, we call them the Stanleys. Uh, I've, I've been to the stands. I've been to Afghanistan, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan. I've been to all these all these countries that used to be owned uh, by the by the Soviet Union. And then I think at the time I was in Uzbekistan, they had their independence for about 25 years at that time. And you see the state that they're in trying to trying to survive and rebuild in this third world society. And then you come back to America and you're like, God, you know, how many steps away are we from our economy crumbling and, and the government just continuing to turn its back on us before we reach that point? And back then in 2023, when I or excuse me, when in 2003, 20 years ago, when I when I got back from Uzbekistan, it seemed like we were generations from that happening. However, year by year, it seems like it's just compounding and, and getting here so much faster where, where that reality seems like it could very realistically be on the on the horizon. So, and so Mike, worries. really quick, you you brought this up and, and I want you to continue um, going down this this path here. But I mean, it sounds like maybe some of the main issues that you're really identifying right now isn't necessarily what's happening here in the country, but rather our, our footing on a global stage. Is, is that fair? And if so, maybe give a little bit more context in terms of, of how you would address that, obviously now running for Congress. No, absolutely. Our, 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 our footprint on a, on a global scale is, is highly important because the other countries have historically looked at America and saw what we were doing and they adjusted. And let's just take the, the, the current administration that we have now, they have really not been a a, a footing of, of power in the in the last couple of years since since Biden has taken taken presence to make the foreign affairs more or less align with the policy that that should be heading in the right direction. You have let let's just look at Iran. Iran's funding cyber attacks. Uh, across the globe, and it's even impacted the U.S. of A. I believe in Pennsylvania just a few weeks ago, there was a cyber attack of a uh, water treatment plant over there, and they they kind of shut down uh, temporarily some of the some of the functions of, of that of that plant because they were trying to attack anything that was uh, had Israel software in it. And let's back up a little bit more and let's look at the trade that we did with Iran as far as getting getting the our, our prisoner swap and we released 10 billion dollars worth of funds that wasn't supposed to be used for anything terror related or anything however all that does on a global scale is it puts a target on the back of every veteran and every soldier that wears the uniform when they're over there your your neighborhood terrorist in some of these uh, countries looks at every U.S. citizen and every soldier as a payday, as a, as a payout. If they can get them and hold them, and and hopefully in seventy two hours they can get a ransom. If a ransom doesn't come on, they can discard them and, and try it again next time. This isn't uh, a standard that that you really want to put out there to all these these four nations that that we are making deals with with terrorists. We're making deals with these countries that are that are holding our people. Uh, the, the adage that we always stood where we did not negotiate with these type of people. 
and now we're negotiating with them too much and too often and it's just too frequent to make America seem like the the powerhouse that it has always historically been. And hey, Michael, especially really quick, when, just, yes. just to, to follow up on that, where, where do you think these anti-American sentiments came from? Um, I mean, obviously, you've, you've spent over a decade in the armed services, so I'm sure you have maybe a little bit more context where this has all come from. Um, but, I mean, to the average listener, it's like, well, we heard the, the old adage of, well, they hate us because of our freedoms. And I think that the past 15, 20 years has maybe reverse engineered that argument a little bit um, because, I don't know, the past three years with COVID, I don't know if we had too many freedoms that they were hating us for then. <laughs> um, but where do, where do you think this um, this hatred of, of American sentiment has coming from and, and how do we maybe appropriately address that moving forward? Right. Now, let's back up 20 years. When, when, first time I ever walked in the country to Kazakhstan, I walked into a bazaar and you had people selling rugs, fruit, vegetables and everything. And when I'd speak, it's, it's crystal clear I'm an American, even though we, you know, you're really not supposed to broadcast uh, that you were from the the United States, it's everybody there knows what an English accent stands for. You can't say you're from Canada or Australia because people know. However, people were overjoyed. They were extremely excited to meet an American to, you know, they, they would try to discount things and say, hey, you know, please buy this for me because I really want to, you know, you know, to support America. Everything was pro US of A. And even in Uzbekistan and, and, other countries like that. And these are countries that are just right north of Afghanistan. And so you have everything that was in turmoil right there with Afghanistan. However, you had so many people that were pro United States that close to a, to a war zone. And now you have so many people and it just, and it doesn't just happen like, you know, Iran, they chant death to America. You have other countries over there that are just super anti, anti American values, traditions, and everything, because they also see that it's it's not just the freedoms that we have, but it's, it's in, in certain aspects, it also boils down to the Christian faith as well. Why do a lot of people hate Israel? They hate Israel because, you know, they believe Israel doesn't have a country. They shouldn't be there. And they're, they're the Jewish people. And then Christianity sprung from the Jewish faith. And you have a lot of people that are anti-American just mainly because they're really anti-Christian and they're anti-Christian because they're anti-Jew. And that that happens in certain aspects of the Arab world. However, you have certain colleges over here that are holding marches of pro-Palestinian, you know, rhetoric and also pro-Hamas rhetoric that at a certain point, you have to wonder, do these college kids even know what they're saying? Do they know what they're spouting or are they just trying to Right on a fad where it's all group they see it's all grouping, Michael. It's all grouping. They they, they they see this as, you know, this is this is the, the the new thing. This is this is what we're gonna try to try to march and represent and, and share our voice for. And they have no foundation, no foundation and no base for what they're actually spouting. And it's and it's kind of worrisome because these are college kids. These are kids that are supposed to be improving their education and actually digging down to find what's the next level, what's the root of these things that I'm standing for or, or, or screaming. And, and I believe every generation wants to march for something. Every generation wants to stand for something. We, we, we had our Civil Rights Act where you had people marching for the right reasons and everybody was coming together with unity and it empowered those generations to do that. And then you had, uh, you know, when you had the, the women's movement, you had, you had the Civil Rights Movement, you had all these movements that brought people together for the right reasons. And right now you have so much things, so so many things missing within this generation. And, and mainly because it's you have you have this right here that has all these social networking platforms on there. And people are trying so hard to connect with other people and find uh, just a mustard seed of reasoning to, to unite behind. And mm. sadly, they're they're choosing a lot of the wrong things because they're 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 grabbing leading things that they're, that's making the news. And so they look at Palestine as, as possibly the underdog because Israel has the Iron Dome and they're the big guy in the, in the territory. When realistically, when you look at a map, they're not. 
it's all about power dynamics, Michael. Um, that that's a lot of the uh, the CRT, that critical race theory. Um, right. All about power dynamics, control. Um, but let, let's you, you started a segue into some more uh, so some more conversation topics that are domestic here in the United States. So let's um, as we go towards the the last ten minutes or so of the episode, let's um, put our microscope there. So uh, we talked about overseas. Let's talk about you know here at home. You talked about some college students and and colleges and really a a cultural shift that we've seen away from what seems to be more along the lines of common sense, logic, and reason, and now more towards, as we identify this groupthink, this cult-like mentality. Talk to us about other issues you're identifying here at home that you would want to go to Congress and hopefully be able to have some impact on uh, before it's too late. Right. No, absolutely. And especially within my district. So District 2 ranks as the eighth poorest district in the nation. It's the top poorest district in the state. However, it's the largest footprint in the state of Georgia. It encompasses 30 counties. So it's a it's a huge district. However, it has been a blue Democrat held district for the past 150 years. The last Republican was Richard Whitley and he held office in he got out of office in 1875. So 150 years come this next election, this district will have been blue. And the reason is a lot of these old guard conservatives, these these old old dog Democrats, that their great grandfathers were were Democrat, and they've kind of kept voting that whole rhetoric right down the line. Well, now they're starting to be a shift. Their 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 billfold is starting to get impacted because of the Bidenomics that are that are happening right now in the country, and is extremely stressing the poor districts such as District 2, where your pantry is not being filled. It's it's not even being halfway filled. The $300 that used to be able to fill up groceries in the trunk of your car is barely filling up a passenger seat when, you, when you're driving home. And so Bidenomics is not just hurting, hurting the nation, and it is, but it's specifically hurting these poor districts. And so going to Congress, there, there's a multitude of things that, that we want to tackle, but we also want to we, we want to get fiscal responsibility under control. We want to get the budget under control. We want to make sure that all these redundant things that are happening in the federal government is eliminated. There's so many redundancies. There's so many bloatation in the federal government that we can strip. And a lot of people like to look at the budget when they get there and say, well, what can we what can we trim off? Well, it's, it's best from a, from a business standpoint is you just start from zero. You start from zero and then you look at what you need and you build from there. That's how you get a realistic budget. You don't say, what, what can we tweak? Because everything needs to be tweaked. There's, there's too much. We've kind of just, it's like a ball of yarn. We've just kind of added to the spool every year until it's just out of control. And if you try to pluck one, one yarn out, one little, one little thing, it, it's, 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 even too big to unravel. It's just it's just so bloated. And so you start from square one. You start from zero and say, what do you need? And then everything that you can strip from the federal government and pass down to the state, that's what you do. Education, take it back down to the state level. Everything, get get the IRS. We don't need a bloated IRS in our federal government like we like 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 we have now. And then hiring eighty thousand additional IRS uh, persons is ridiculous. The budgets too extreme. And so we're going to get all that. We're going to take it down. We're going to focus a lot more on trade schools. Uh, trade schools do not get enough recognition and enough support that we need. And we need a lot of blue collar people to actually do the jobs in America. We need industry. We need industry to come back into the states. We need to be able to manufacture back in America. We need that stamp of made in the USA put back on a lot of the goods that we have here in America. And it's one of those things where a lot of people say, well, you're, you're one vote in a, in, in a room of 435 people. So what are you going to do and how are you going to make this happen? Well, one person needs to bring the fight because it doesn't start without somebody walking into the yard and pushing the biggest boy in the yard to, to, to kind of get the ball rolling. You have to start the fight and you cannot be scared to fight it. And that's where a lot of these lifelong politicians, they're, they're too scared to rock the boat because they're inward focused. They're not focused on the nation and on the state. You got to be able to go there, start the fight. And then keep gaining ground, start the movement because people want a movement. You got to you got to stay transparent and have this bidirectional communication to back with your district and with the state and with the other people in the country. Because your that your vote is not just helping Georgia or I should say my vote would not just be helping Georgia. It would be helping 
all of the US of A. And everybody wants to save money. Everybody wants to have their taxes cut. Everybody wants to go home and feel safe at night, even though you have a lot of people that are anti-closed border, but they're very pro wanting to keep their doors locked at night. And so you, you have to you have to come to terms on reality. And a lot of this border security, I'm very pro border security, but we have to get these programs the recognition they need, such as the H-2A and the H-2B immigrant uh, working programs. Those have to get recognition so that way people can say, well, these are viable options. We can close the border. We don't need all these people running through, you know, the Rio Grande and, and swimming across the rivers to come here because of nobody to do the work when you have these programs that help you know the farmers h2a has helped the farmers in this district for years they use this every year because people do not want to jump out there and work in the fields like our great grandparents used to do people have gotten lazy but these people these these migrants that are coming on these h2a working visas that stay here for six months and go back home and it's all on the up and up these people come here make great money and get sent back home and they do well now i was i was making some calls the other day and i spoke to a gentleman in texas who had a carnival and and, and this this just impressed me so much just i've never talked to a real life carny before <laughs> and this guy he uh he used to travel he, it was passed down from the carnival was passed down from his grandfather to his father to himself. And he travels the United States with his carnival. And he used to just hire young teenage boys and girls, you know, in every town that he went to. And he'd spin them up, you know, 24 hours of this is how you do it. And then they'd stay there for a couple of weeks and then he'd move on to the next town. Well, as rides have gotten so complicated and safety regulations have gotten so strict, you can't train somebody in 24 hours to do a job that you're just going to be there for two weeks and then move on. Right. And so, his only solution was he had to start using the H-2B visa program to get these bikers to come and do six month work limits in his carnival so he can travel the United States and actually have one person that's trained and knows exactly the, the policies and regulations. So that way, if he ever, you know, you know, the state comes and actually asks, you know, you know, does an audit of him, he's on the up and up. And so these H-2 programs do not just help farms. I mean, they, they, they help the the small town carnivals across America, and uh and, and it, was, it was it was it was just mind blowing just to hear some of the stories he had. But programs like that, and you have these these people that they're super supportive of of shutting down the border and getting border security because they know the policies. But you have a lot of these people that just they spill the rhetoric of, you know, we need these people in here. Who else is going to do the job? And you're like you know, well, what, what, what programs right now are available? They're like, well, we don't have any because they're just, they don't make themselves knowledgeable of, of the tools that we have at hand. And, and I believe that's where a lot of the open border rhetoric comes from is people, people, they have, they have bleeding hearts, but you got to follow the rules. Michael Nixon for Congress, Georgia's second. Uh, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. And unfortunately we are hard pressed for time, which means we're going to go ahead and uh, let folks know where they can go ahead, support the campaign, support uh, you financially. If they have enjoyed what they've heard today and they want to get involved, the website is Nixon4GA.com. Michael, where can folks go ahead, support you and learn more about the campaign? Absolutely. Uh, go to nixonforga.com or nixonforgeorgiaspeedout.com. Uh, we have both websites and they also have uh, a donation link on that page. Please go to that website, donate to the campaign. We're fighting a 30 year incumbent. And so we, we want to make our war chest as, as big as possible to stand toe to toe with him advertising and, and, and bring this bring this victory home. We're going to turn this district red for the first time in 150 years. And we're going to bring some common sense back to Washington, D.C. There you go, folks. If you enjoyed today's episode, which I know you did, go ahead, give it a share. When you do, please tag yours truly at B Nichols Liberty. You can find the show over on your favorite audio and video platforms. For the audio, you can find us on Apple Podcasts, YouTube Music, Spotify, wherever it is you get your podcasts. And for the uh, video version of the show, YouTube, Rumble, Ben Swan's Sovereign, which is spelled S O V. 
R-E-N. And of course, we are uploading our entire episodes to X.com in their entirety. So go over there and give us some love. And if you are going to go ahead and check us out on like your YouTubes, for example, please go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Hit the little notification bell so you don't miss a single time. We have a brand new episode like today's. And also, please go down below in the comments. What do you want to see from your elected officials in 2024? Let us know. Is, is Michael on the right path? Please continue the conversation, and we will definitely make sure uh, we, we bring it back to Michael. Let him know what uh, he has to say. With that being said, folks, if you want to get in touch with me, email me, brian at briannicholsshow.com. And please go ahead, support the sponsors we have here on the program, like Cardio Miracle, BNC Technology Advisors, Ebels. Uh, we have Blood of Tyrants and more. So one more time, go to our sponsor page and support all those awesome organizations. With that being said, Brian Nichols signing off here on The Brian Nichols Show for Michael Nixon. We'll talk to you next time. Thanks for listening to The Brian Nichols Show. Find more episodes at briannicholsshow.com.